Agent, glad you could make it. I'm Major Milestone. I'll be running the stop. Sixteen hours ago, Amadeus Gildenstern used a time machine to kidnap all the presidents. All of them? Yes, even the bad ones. We received this video from him shortly after the kidnapping. I am Amadeus Gildenstern, leader of the executive branch and rightful president of the United States. Sixteen hours ago, I used a time machine to kidnap the presidents, even the bad ones. My demands are simple. Reinstate me as president forever, or lose every president forever. Furthermore... He goes on for another four hours, but it gets pretty boring after that. Agent, your mission is simple. Infiltrate Amadeus Island, collect relevant intel, and build your own time machine. A time machine? Major, that's impossible! Not after Gildenstern used his to kidnap the presidents, it isn't. We need to capture that intel. But first things first, Agent. Before we start, you'll need to clear a training program. Let's go. Hey everyone, I'm Alfred. Welcome to Never Stop Sneaking. Arrow keys, gamepad, or click and drag. Okay, weird. Espionage, ESP is the currency we use here in the Department of Sneak. Like as much as you can. So, Metal Gear Solid is one of my... Stop with a spinning circle to interact. Metal Gear Solid is my favorite franchise of all time, actually. Mm hmm. Cool. And this is very obviously a uh, pastiche drawn from Metal Gear Solid 1. You have bullets. Alright. Interesting. Don't need to face an enemy. If you have bullets, take them up before you worry. Weird. See, this game is based off of MGS1, but it's made to, it's built to be more like a phone game. You have a smoke grenade. Useless against machines. Um, turret impervious. Okay. Security cameras can't hurt you, but they'll alert nearby enemies. Very well. This is built to be a mobile game, which is why it's very simple. Which isn't a bad thing, but I learned that it's also a roguelike. The evil executive branch. Special weak point. Okay. Nice. Oh god. And then also, naturally, one Mr. Aaron Hansen is uh, a voice actor in this game. Incredible work, ace your mission, and are ready for active duty. Never stop sneaking. Well done, Agent. Structures available. Sneak admissions. Cool. How much do you know about Amadeus Gilderstern? This wasn't the briefing. He leads an organization of villains called the Executive Branch, and he wants to be President of the United States. 
I'm going to move myself over. There we go. Correct, Agent. Appreciate you paying attention because I am not half the time. I know his name from somewhere else. It sounds familiar. Should. He was <laughs> President of the United States for 47 minutes in April of 45. When FDR died, no one could find the Vice President or anyone else in the line of succession. They went down the line until they got to Amadeus Gilderstern, Assistant Postmaster General. He was power for 37 minutes before it, take, it was taken away from him. Been simple. Make him President again. We lose every President we have ever had or ever will have. Uh, reiterate. So, like, how far does he go into the future? John Henry Eden? Uh, to reiterate, your mission is to build a time machine and to stop Gilderstein from kidnapping the presidents. Understood? Affirmative, Major Milestone. Any other agents? Uh, Senator Robiscout uh, Eddie, keep an eye out for his supply points. <laughs> to the uh, enemy's garbage to find useful tech, and then he sells it back to us. Sounds good. All right. Agent, we've got an incoming communique from Gildenstern. Oh, look at that teeny tent. It's so quaint. If you want to stop me, you would need like 12 of those. 12 tents. Gildenstern, you're a madman. You're the only mad one here, Major. Major. You can never stop me. I know you're infiltrating my base, getting mud everywhere. But every time you leave, it's just a flick of a switch, and my time machine undoes all your progress. Amadeus, out! Don't fret, Agent. That ESP you collect is concrete intel. We can use it to expand our operations and stop Gildenstern. Even if that's the case, Gildenstern can still see what we're doing. We need to build a new HQ. Something underground. It's Gavin Shelf. You don't know why Gildenstern would hide literal life essence throughout his base, but this perk helps you find more hearts. <laughs> yes, it's very simple, um, but it's a roguelike, and I love those. So naturally, I'm going to give this a shot. It's also stealth-based and very aggressive. I love stealth games. What's more, there's also a mechanic that encourages uh, encourages you to wall scrape. Key guard, locked rooms, yada yada. Um, I often do that in roguelikes anyway. I'll scrape every wall for all the goodies I can possibly find. Um, and this encourages me to do so. Since I've got... Nice. Perk agent, yada yada. The sneak blade is very good. Maybe too good. Far Eye scouts the air and snatches up anything he finds. That guy has lovely and valuable items. They're dirty and lazy like most organic life. Mm hmm. Hilariously large box of ammo containing everything. I would maybe perhaps prefer like a game that's almost a little more concrete, has a little more like mechanics, but this is fun. Um, it's cool. I like the aesthetic. I love the aesthetic, in fact.
kind of game that there's nothing wrong with, you know? Besides, maybe it's just a little simple. But that's not so bad. Um, but the thing about, like, games that are basically built to be, like, phone-ready is that sometimes they're just inherently less complex just because of how the game itself works. So maybe we'll have a little problem with that where we just don't have as much... The game can't expand as much as um, a typical game would be able to. But I do love this game and I want to support the developers, so I bought it at full price. Health scavenge. Uh, I'm yet to get hit, I think. Let's double back. Currently for me, it's a Saturday. Oh, God. Jinxed it. It's a Saturday. Um, I watched some Resident Evil with my wife. Um, we hung out. And then uh, we split off to go do our own thing. So she's going to do the chores that she needs to do. And I'm going to work one. Um, I do chores during the week for a reference. So my bullets get reset. It would make the most sense. Package. Also, of course, they hired Aaron Hansen to go be on their Metal Gear joke project. For those who don't know, and this is a th this is a thing that I'm not even like joking with. Prior to being on Game of Grumps, Aaron Hansen made a lot of uh, animations. That was what he was primarily known for. And uh, his most famous series was the Awesome series. And probably the most famous example of that was Metal Gear Awesome. The concept is just he takes a video game or franchise and swaps out one of the words in the title for awesome. And then has a bunch of jokes about the game. Sometimes they're very poorly researched, I will say. Sometimes they're not even funny. Shod and Freud. They've got cool designs. Nice. So as long as there's enough bosses in this, because this isn't a very hard roguelike, and roguelikes are usually known for extreme difficulty. I'm going to turn myself down and the game down a little more. Yeah, we might be fine. Anyway, um, the Awesome series is alright. Personally, I think uh, Girl Chan in Paradise is better. In power, we get more work. Glad I could help. What's next? Sneaking missions at night. Plan to... <laughs> See the operating budget? Did you watch the intro? I didn't even get a parachute. Stash of tools inside there. Alright. Dig it. I dig it. 
Scavenge ammo. Hummingbird, turtle dove, nightingale, sparrow. Jungle camo, obsidian black. Holy shit. Anyway, as I say, um, some of Aaron Hansen's most famous work was uh, Metal Gear related. So naturally, they brought him back for doing this. Since Aaron Hansen is technically a voice actor. Kind of wild the career path that Aaron Hansen has taken. It all went downhill once he appeared on the tester. I will say that this is a very resource based roguelike. Which is pretty cool. Um, it very much encourages you to use your gear, to use your stuff. Though combat is so simple that like... Sometimes it doesn't really feel like an issue. Oh, I didn't know he could see me. Oh, well. Yes, you can very much tell that this was sort of made to be more of a mobile game. Oh, that's a door. That makes sense. I'm good, bro. I don't know about you. Oh, crap. I missed a package. Until suggest it's on this floor. Eyes up, boss. See, one of the things about this game is that it's not really a parody of Metal Gear. Um, it uses the ideas in Metal Gear as like a basis. But, like, it treats Metal Gear as almost like it's a genre. Grab the tools. Fancy set. Eight kinds of screwdrivers. Who needs that many? Great work. Song of the camp I built. Piece of canvas with gas generator. Proper sneaking HQ. Alright. Well, we're gonna keep going, and then I'm probably gonna pause it. Agent Handyman. The sneaking blade is good. I like the fact that it's just called the sneak blade. But yeah, as a parody of Metal Gear Solid, this is kind of shallow. As just a game that just kind of wants to use like the Metal Gear Solid like texture pack. I guess. It's fine.
We have almost a Devil May Cry-esque style meter as well. So you gotta move quick. But yeah, this is a game that I can like literally play one-handed. I haven't used my left hand all sesh. Of course, the second I take it off of my desk, I get shot. Right in the abdomen. It's like cameras are my biggest problem. I love how bad video game cameras are. Like, it makes zero sense that video game cameras are that bad. Why would they be, you know? Great, level 2 of scavenge health. If I had any health, it'd be nice. Hmm. Something of a tricksy corner. Right, that's a door. Extraction successful, huh? All right. <laughs> Level two access. Oh, whoa, we're flying. That's kind of cool. If I were playing this, like, exclusively on my phone, I would say that this is a pretty fantastic game. As a PC game that I paid, like, 12 bucks for, it's a little... Eh. Uh, the design principles are pretty good, and I really do like the art. I think that more games should emulate a PlayStation 1 art style. Um, either via, like, the really excellent pixel art that things like Symphony of the Night expose you to, or things like bit-crushed, very pixelated 3D graphics. Because I feel like um, games of this era, of the late 90s, have a significant amount of appreciation for them that does not get seen in, like, anywhere else. I'm good, bro. Ooh. So it just makes the runs longer, I see. I still have got that bullet. Pizzazz! Yeah, as I've said, combat is very simple. Which is not necessarily a bad thing. I like the combination of EXP and espionage to ESP. 
I think that's rather clever. Um, I love just the obnoxious anime haircuts. Like this giant Polnareff cut. That's pretty good. And the huge... What's her name? Hummingbird? The huge, huge, like, super anime spikes. I love how, um... Most anime parodies will go for, like, those giant, crazy anime spikes that are probably physically impossible in real life. But most anime don't do that anymore. And at the time, it was only a few. Like, Dragon Ball Z was the craziest, but, like... Eh, for a lot of people, anime is just Dragon Ball Z. Or if you're a girl, it's Sailor Moon. I could probably use this game in like a big video essay about why we should expect more from our parodies. Because as it is, I'm not even sure if this is supposed to be a parody. Okay, I've only just now noticed this, but the camera angles in this game are kind of balls. Like, because I'm pushing down here, and right here, and up here. And the whole game is just kind of at a really weird angle. Like, we have, like, weird Dutch angles going on. I think you have to be a Scientologist to appreciate Dutch angles. It's part of their thing. Ambassadors 246. Oh, God. It's down, attack. Oh, I see. Okay, I see. Nice. Ah, oh, crap. I didn't do that thing. Oops. Got too excited. Another thing is that, um,. A lot of games that use Metal Gear Solid as, like, their base only do... I'm aware. I have played a video game before. I know what a key card is. I guess since this is a roguelike, this is, like, unofficially uh, first episode of Season 2 of Friday Night Roguelikes. Since, as I mentioned, I have considered doing another season. That was cool. And like, it was totally auto fire, but it was still pretty cool. Yeah, use your resources. No reason not to. Oh, health. Sweet. Armor. Cool. So, I'm going to guess non-replenishable health. It makes a sense. Ooh. Big one. Yeah, only Metal Gear Solid 1 has a snowy area. Metal Gear Solid 2 is all on oil platforms and boats. Three is all in Russia, which makes you think that it would be cold, but it's actually set in Selinoyarsk. Um, and like the grasslands of Russia, where like it's not awful and freezing all the time. Which is also very refreshing, because everyone who thinks of Russia in a video game, or in the real world too, really, they're always like, oh yeah, it's, it's the big scary cold place that our granddad was afraid of during the Cold War. This'll hide me, right? Yeah, well, nice. And so to see Russia as like a place with grasslands and swamps and like 
crocodiles. That's cool, man. So I haven't hit a repeated boss yet, which is good. Because, like, I think that roguelikes, if they have a level boss structure, should have bosses that won't repeat on you. Gun jumping. Another thing about Metal Gear, which I feel like this game has working against it. Oh yeah, as for the settings, um, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance is all over the world. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 4 is all over the world. Metal Gear Solid 5 is split between Afghanistan and... Take Northern Africa. It's Angola and Zaire. It's the border between those. To the point where the map area is called Angola-Zaire border. Anytime you go there. Man. Their line of sight is literally a line of sight. Yeah. Maybe they only had time to make the assets of just the snowy parts, so they wanted to make it look like Shadow Moses Island. But like, man... I've seen a lot of Shadow Moses Island. Which is the setting of Metal Gear Solid 1, by the way. I think, however, I do think that Ghost Babel um, and the Metal Gear Acid games also draw from Shadow Moses. Partially because they just want you to remember. Oh, that's interesting. There, there should be more games on oil platforms. Although, I will say, it actually is uh, a thing that Metal Gear Solid uses as, as almost like a default. Because you, there are four different games with settings on oil platforms. Metal Gear Solid 2 has an oil cleanup platform. Actually, no, I think there might be five. Um, Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. Your base of operations is on an oil platform. The Peace Walker is a prequel. What? Don't I have a key card? Could have swore. Uh, that oil platform gets destroyed in Ground Zeroes. There we go. There's a key card. Uh, but you get a new one in Phantom Pain. And the oil platform in Phantom Pain becomes the setting in either... Metal Gear 1 or Metal Gear 2. I forget which. I'm not filling up. Some Metal Gear uh, games do this thing that I adore. Where if you're full and you get an item or a resource of some kind. It just sends the... It sends the leftover to your bank as money. So like, hey, if you're full on like repair nano paste and you pick up a repair nano paste in Rising, it just counts that as money. If you pay for a full restore, like a, a full refresh in Metal Gear Solid Five, but you only needed a few things out of it, it'll refund you for whatever you didn't need, and that's great. Vice President helicopter again, huh?
It's not quite a Don Maku. The, the width and ready access of the platforms make it really easy. Um, the reason that Vice President Helicopter is a big important boss is because there's a helicopter fight in every Metal Gear game. Um, I would say most notably in Peace Walker because for whatever reason, uh, the helicopter fight... <laughs> Air ventilator. Oh, we might actually have enough of that. Breathe when you construct the underground HQ. <laughs> All right. Your habits are questionable. Zounds, you're right. Do you know that Zounds is actually short for the Wounds of Christ? Hmm. I will say, I also do appreciate that they got a very, very realistic, authentic Metal Gear theme. I feel like these levels often start like this. Um, for those unfamiliar with Metal Gear, every single Metal Gear game has a big, obvious vocal theme. Um, I forget what Calling to the Night is. What is Calling to the Night? Is Calling to the Night... No, one, MGS1 has the best is yet to come. Um... I think what 2 is, as well. 2 might be the game that I've played the least, maybe. Yes, I've only done one playthrough of 2. Um, and I know a lot less about it. But then three obviously has the world famous song Snake Eater, which is a goofy, big, silly, like, Bond theme song that is legitimately good. And then Peace Walker has Heaven's Divide, which, as I mentioned, plays during the helicopter fight in that game. I think Portable Ops is calling to the night. I think that's right. And I think it also might be the best part about portable ops. It does feel really clean to just pop a guy like that. We now come to day like what is it? We're in the couple hundreds now of me wanting them to remake Metal Gear 1 and 2. Some people argue that they don't really, you don't really need uh, remakes of those games. I don't think you do either, actually. Those games are still actually pretty solid, but I think it'd be nice. I think Solid 1 got a remake. I think we deserve a remake of Metal Gear 1 and 2. For those who are just unfamiliar, most people refer to the Metal Gear franchise as just consisting of the Metal Gear Solid games. Which isn't actually the case. It actually started with a franchise called Metal Gear. And there was Metal Gear 1 and Metal Gear 2. And the third game is called Metal Gear Solid. Metal Gear 1 and 2 were not released in America. So, for most people, the series starts at Solid. Which is like saying Castlevania starts at Symphony of the Night. Oh god. I'm getting impatient. Um, Metal Gear Solid 1 ended up being one of the biggest hits that the PlayStation ever saw, ever. So naturally, people loved it. And it got greenlit for a sequel where the director, Hideo Kojima, was allowed to do as much crazy stuff as he wanted. 
which is why Metal Gear Solid 2 is one of the craziest, weirdest games ever. Like, straight up ever. Um, and I think that everyone should know about Metal Gear Solid 2, even if they're not a fan of Metal Gear and don't know the other games. Because all the people that you like love Metal Gear Solid 2. The director of Undertale, Toby Fox, cited Metal Gear Solid 2 as a big inspiration for how he directed Undertale. Um, same goes for the guy who made Doki Doki Literature Club. And saying that might spoil Metal Gear Solid 2 a little bit, but, you know. I think the best way to go into any game that has a big twist in that nature is not knowing the twist. Some people disagree with me. Um, I don't believe that to be the case, though. I think if a game has a cool twist, you should let the twist play out like they want you to. But at the time, Metal Gear Solid 2 was extremely polarizing. Some people hated it. Some people loved it. Some people hated the story, but loved the gameplay. Some people thought that the gameplay had a bunch of extra stuff you didn't really need, but thought the story was brilliant. The story is brilliant. I will not dis I will not permit such slander on my channel. Um, but needless to say, it lost a lot of people. So they're like, Kojima, we love you, but Dr. Acula. But yeah, it lost a lot of people. Nice. So they were like, Kojima, bring it back. Uh, and he did via Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. Which is brilliant and fantastic. It's a prequel, which means that it actually ends up having one of the most simple stories. Because all the weird stuff hasn't happened yet. Shiny Cube Corp. Um, yeah, all the weird stuff has not happened yet. In 3. The only weird thing is the fact that uh, World War II was fought and won by superheroes. Which, compared to the other things that Metal Gear has you accept before that, like the President of the United States was a supervillain. And, like, dual-wielded katanas. By the way, that's a real thing, yeah. In the Metal Gear Solid universe, the President was a samurai who dual-wielded katanas, and the name of the katanas were Democrat and Republican. Whoops. Yeah, three is uh, three is v much less contentious, and I'm of the opinion that Metal Gear Solid Three is the greatest game of all time. Like, no joke, literally of all time, I think it is the best game ever made. So I'm a little biased for Metal Gear, is what I'm getting at. Um, in the meantime, we also started to get spin-offs. Metal Gear Acid is a card game. And it's a card game not like Yu-Gi-Oh! is a card game, but like... Oh, what's that Kingdom Hearts game? Basically, it's just like a normal Metal Gear Solid game, but instead of doing anything with guns, everything is done via cards. I might play it on the channel because I've never played it and I'm interested. But because it's a spin-off and not canon, it has a different title. It is Metal Gear Acid, so not Metal Gear Solid. There's also a Game Boy Color game, which I really want to play, called Metal Gear... It is called Metal Gear Solid, but it's not canon. But it's Metal Gear Solid Ghost Babel. Ghost Babel. In keeping with how a lot of other games have had cool name, biblical name, back to back. So like, Shadow Moses, Outer Heaven, Ghost Babel. Like Babylon, I assume. Uh, and then there was Portable Ops, which is the only one that's meant to be canon. However, it is canon in the way that, like, the Marvel Netflix shows are canon. 
They're canon, but if anything that they said contradicts with things that happened later by the actual creators, they're out. The second that they make canon problematic, they are non-canon. We're not gonna we're not gonna uncanonize our new thing that we actually care about to canonize the thing that someone else made that we don't care about. That's what Metal Gear Portal Ops is. It's only the big important parts of that game are canon. Like, yes, that's uh, yes, that's where Gray Fox is introduced. Yes, that's where Big Boss starts to build an army. Yes, that's what happens uh, happened to a chunk of the Philosopher's Legacy, etc., etc. Why did he build these things out of wood in his base? Is it for the aesthetic? Because I can believe that. Yeah, Portable Ops takes place in an area called San Jaraimo. And the most reference it is given anywhere else in canon is at the start of the next game in the timeline, Peace Walker. Uh, one of the characters says, we can finally put all that bullshit at San Jaraimo behind us. And that's the only mention that Portable Ops gets in the rest of the timeline. The fact that it was bullshit and we need to put it behind us and get away from it. Um, but the next game to come out was after Portable Ops was four. And Kojima was already not planning to do th three, I think. Was really not planning to do four. Um, or so the story goes. I think that he was planning to do four all along, considering how well it meets up. Um, and four is very melodramatic. However, I love it regardless. I don't think its use of melodrama is necessarily a bad thing. And I think it's still a very enjoyable game with a very good story and a lot of payoff. Um... Because literally everything from the past 50 years of timeline and 30 years of video game have a payoff. Was it 30 years? I don't think so. It started pretty late in the 80s, so I think it was only 20 years. Maybe a little more. And he was like, alright, I'm done. I'm not doing any more Metal Gear Solid and you won't make me. So like, hey Kojima, remember how they made Portable Ops and it was like kind of like a Metal Gear game, but not really? What if you made another game that was portable and involved soldier collecting? But you did it. And he was like, yeah, okay, I'll come back. And he did. Um, and then he made Peace Walker. And Peace Walker is very good and everyone should play it. A lot of people um, kind of don't treat it like the others because it's not a tactical espionage operations game. Oh, no, sorry. The other games are referred to with the tagline Tactical Espionage Action. Peace Walker is called Tactical Espionage Operation. Because the plot of the game consists of gathering up soldiers like Pokemon uh, and doing base building things while also trying to do normal Metal Gear things. There we go. It also has a mission structure where, like, it goes level by level as opposed to... Oop. It goes level by level as opposed to having one long campaign like all the other games do. And Peace Walker is very good. Peace Walker was then followed immediately by um, Grand Zeroes. Uh, which is only like one year later in the timeline. Oh, interesting. You can bust up things. Oh. So you've chosen death. Uh, Ground Zeroes is very short, and as far as I know, is actually intended to be the original first level of the game following it, Phantom Pain. 
but because they wanted more money, they split that game into two games. So Phantom Pain and Ground Zeroes are two separate games. Oh. <laughs> I don't know much beyond buildings and the building of buildings. If you have a building, then he's building. Nice. <laughs> Engineer Parsons and Agent Handyman. How silly. So yes, the mechanic of collecting dudes and bringing them back to base to work for you is very like very portable ops very phantom pain very ground zeros very peace walker anyway because of the turnabout in the timeline the first few games that we actually saw are about a guy named solid snake and the prequel games you play as a guy named big boss who is solid snake's dad via cloning But our first introduction to Big Boss is actually, well, technically, it's as an ally, but he betrays you. So, the first real introduction to Big Boss in the series is as a villain. So, in any game set in, like, the past, all the prequel games that are set from the 60s to the late 80s. So, Snake Eater all the way to Phantom Pain. You play as Big Boss, and it's about him being a hero like Snake, and then eventually turning to villainy. Except not really a villain, just morally complex and kind of misguided, yada yada, etc, etc. There are no real villains in Metal Gear besides, like, Volgan, Senator Armstrong, Sundowner. Most of the big bosses, well, I say big boss, but like, most of the larger, more important villains are actually morally complex. Like, it's telling that when I f first played Metal Gear Solid 1, I thought Liquid Snake was one of the most, like, intelligent and non-villainous villains ever. And then upon actually playing other Metal Gear games afterwards, I was like, like, Liquid Snake is a low-tier villain in terms of how uh, complex he is. Yeah, so from the 60s to the 80s, you play as Big Boss and eventually start as a hero, turn to evil. And then we come back around to Metal Gear 1, where we're playing as Solid Snake, fighting Big Boss. And you play as him from the 90s to the 2010s. There's also other playable characters and a lot more, like, charm and intelligent things that I'm just kind of glossing over. Um, as I'm recording this, this is currently... This is March. Uh, I got this game for my birthday, which is why I'm playing it. Um, and also, it's a roguelike, and I love those, but... The real reason I'm playing this is because it's a birthday present, and I want to I wanna play with my new toy. So when this actually finally comes out... I'll add this to the Metal Gear playlist because, come on, look at it. You're really up my ass, bro. I will say, something that is also a little shallow about this game, it gives you score for killing guys. Um, and, like, it doesn't even count because it is... You just time travel them away to being alive again. But other Metal Gear games give you credit for not killing guys. Um, earlier games give you more score for sparing people. Uh, and in Metal Gear Solid 2, they made doing no-kill playthroughs possible, with a few exceptions. 
because uh, Metal Gear Solid 2 gives the player a tranquilizer pistol. Bobbert, Secretary of Education. one's cool. I kind of like this. It's one of the only fights where you, that I've encountered so far, where you actually have to use your own skills and talents and powers as opposed to whatever mechanic the boss fight elects to give you this time. Which is nice. BOA, base of operations. Nice. Office even has a red phone. Oh. Comms operator. Okay. I'm starting to see it. Oh, cutscene though. You stole my engineer. That is really inconvenient. I was going to add a nice little backsplash to my marble kitchenette. That engineer's talents were wasted on you, Guildenstern. Unless... Were, were you thinking herringbone ceramic tile? Actually, I was thinking reclaimed tin with an embossed finish. With marble countertops? You're a madman! Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> no matter. When I'm president again, nobody will be allowed to criticize my backsplash! Or me! Ever! Why do you even want to be president, Guildenstern? What's in it for you? For me? It's not about me. It's about destiny. Amadeus out. Hmm. Destiny. You know, I've heard know destiny means, is Agent. destiny. I'll have some people look into it. With books. And the internet. Until then, you must continue improving our infrastructure. It's the only way we'll ever build that time machine. All right, Major Milestone. You got it. But how will we rescue the presidents? Where are they even being held? Within the time stream itself. That's why we need the time machine, Agent. Now let's get back to it. Interesting. Well, um, this has been Never Stop Sneaking. It's pretty good. Very simple. Um, if you like a good coffee breaker uh, roguelike that's not very hard and... Like, literally, I'm playing this with one hand. Um, I often use the word coffee breaker or lunch breaker to refer to very short roguelikes where a run is very quick. And this is doubly uh, expedient for a lunch break because I have been doing this one hand the whole video. <laughs> um, so if you've got... Let me enlarge myself here. Oh, God, you can see my whole room. No. Um, if you've got the want to, to play a game, uh, that you can play one handed and eat your dinner with, this is a pretty good one. Um, it's available on switch. It's not very expensive. Uh, I paid $12 for it, which is nowhere near full price. Um, not even for an indie game. Most indie games go for like 20, I would say, but yeah, uh, good game. I need to think of a cool name. I would probably be like Shark something. Spiky Shark out. Yeah. Colonel. Oh, this is only kind of related, but I wanted to show this off. Um, my wife got me this for my birthday. Uh, it's really cool. It's a laptop bag. It fits my laptop perfectly. It's the army you're a part of in Metal Gear Solid 5. And also, I got this. He's a little friend. But yeah. Um, hey, that's technically an episode of Fortnite Night Roguelike. So whenever this comes out, you'll see. Um, you may be able to date the video by my hair because I'm going to probably either get it toned or dyed soon. And uh, But yeah, I've been Alfred. This has been Never Stop Sneaking. I recommend it. It's fun. It is nice. But maybe I just want another Metal Gear game. Or like 
a stealth game that isn't another Far Cry or something like that. Please, stop making open world games. There are enough. But yeah, Ivan Alfred, technically Friday Night Roguelikes, never stop sneaking is good. Buy it. Uh, see ya. Spiky Shark out. Yeah.